as well as the exits located behind you. In the event of an emergency, our audience services staff will assist you. At this time, we'd like to remind you that the taking of photographs and the use of recording devices is not permitted. Also, if you're carrying any cell phones or pagers, please turn them off now. We thank you for joining us and hope you enjoy the program. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Matricia James, Dean of the School of Business, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the eighth annual Kearns Global Business Lecture. This prestigious event has been made possible through the generosity and vision of Maureen and Dick Kearns. Their goal is to engage students with business leaders who offer diverse perspectives on global matters. Today's program will be moderated by Dick and is entitled Getting Back to Business, Challenges in the Post-Pandemic World. At least we like to think it's the post-pandemic world. Dick and his panel of Globe Trotters will discuss the impact of COVID on three key areas, human resources, supply chain and industry, and artificial intelligence. With four decades of professional experience in global markets, Dick Kearns understands that today's students must develop business knowledge along with cultural awareness and agility to succeed and lead in this dynamic world marketplace. Dick began his career at Price Waterhouse in 1972 and was admitted to the partnership in 1984. He was appointed leader of the Global Partner Affairs following the merger that created Price Waterhouse Coopers in 1998. In 2002, he joined Zurich Insurance Group's senior management team in Switzerland, where he served as the group's chief administrative officer. He retired as a member of the group management board in March 2011. Dick served on our board of trustees from 2000 to 2009. He received the 2017 St. Bonaventure Alumnus of the Year Award and an honorary doctorate from St. Bonaventure in 2019. Before I turn the program over to Dick, please note that our panel discussion will run for approximately one hour and will be followed by a very brief question and answer. This year we will have videos from our stellar students from our capstone course, and we will integrate that with discussions from our Globe Trotters, and we really hope that you enjoy it. Also, students, there will be a QR code that will appear on the screen at the end of the program. In addition to our campus audience today, we are joined by students, alumni, and friends from around the world as this program is being shown live on Zoom. With that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dick Kearns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean James, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those uh, joining uh, online, you need to understand it's a great crowd that we have here in the Quick Center. It is October 7th, and it is 79 degrees on campus. So the fact that anyone showed up is a real testament. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be back on campus with you as we all try to get back to normal and back to business. Uh, the masks everyone, unfortunately, has to uh, have to wear indoors here remind us that we're still challenged by the coronavirus and the variant. But we'll continue to push through this just as uh, you've been pushing through every day in your classes and meetings on campus. Uh, continues to remind us that the pandemic has really challenged our lives. And we're here today to specifically talk about how it has transformed business. I want to start by introducing our panel, uh, three of whom are back for their fifth edition of this lecture series and one very special uh, newcomer. Uh, so Donna Gaynor in, in the middle is uh, truly our global citizen. We call ourselves the globe trotter because we've all spent time living and working outside of the United States, but uh, Donard uh, bears the standard. Uh, he is, uh, since his last visit to campus uh, in 2019, Donard has been appointed chairman of the board of Glanbia. That's a public company, Irish-based, uh, with over $4 billion in revenue, 7,400 employees, and operating in 32 countries. Previous to Glanbia, uh, Donard uh, served as a partner with PwC, uh, and in senior executive positions with Seagram's and Beam Wine and Spirits. So Donard, welcome, 
Welcome back. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Jennifer Tornaden uh, joins us um, in, in true pandemic form, remotely. Uh, I hope you can hear us, uh, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer uh, started a new position right after COVID hit uh, last year. She is now Senior Vice President of Sales and Strategic Growth for Legal and General America. Uh, that's the US operations of London-based uh, legal and general insurance, which is the seventh largest uh, life insurer uh, in the world. Uh, Jen moved to the life insurance business after spending most of her career in commercial insurance uh, at both Aon and Zurich. She's a graduate of uh, George Mason, uh, one of our fellow Atlantic 10 institutions, and a Columbia MBA. Uh, and, and Jen, we hope your client meetings, uh, customer meetings are going well, wherever it is you are. Thank you. Great to have I, you back. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, Brian Kearns is uh, CFO and a member of the board of directors of BH uh, Aircraft Company. That's a privately held uh, manufacturer of precision engine parts for aerospace, uh, the aerospace and defense industries. Brian previously held finance positions at Paul Corporation, Goldman Sachs, uh, and Ernst & Young, where he was on international tours uh, in both the UK uh, and in uh, Ireland. Brian's our Big East representative. Uh, he's a Providence College grad and a CPA. Thanks, Brian, as always. Tom McCarthy, um, SBU, class of 2010 and an MBA uh, from 2013, is our newest uh, panel member. Since 2013, Tom has been with Marriott uh, in various sales positions, including with their Ritz-Carlton and W Hotel brands. Uh, if you're interested in a trip to Nashville, Tom is the person you want to talk to. So Tom, welcome back to campus. Uh, it's great to have you. And on behalf of my fellow uh, uh, panel members, uh, we want to thank you for significantly lowering the age of the panel group. Okay. <clears throat> The pandemic has created massive challenges for, uh, for many industries while also creating opportunities for others. And today we want to talk about uh, a few significant trends that have been emerging. Uh, and there are obviously many additional issues to address, but we elected to limit them to the following three uh, uh, topics as, uh, as Dean James indicated. The first is around technology advances that were accelerated during the pandemic. Artificial intelligence and robotics took big leaps forward. Uh, in many cases, big companies had to take risks uh, and innovate quickly. Uh, companies were forced to re-examine how they deliver goods and services in an increasingly digital world. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, second, the workplace as we knew it was likely changed forever by the pandemic. With lockdowns around the world, companies had to rethink their business models on how and where work was performed. Remote and hybrid work models were implemented and companies found that they worked more effectively uh, than anticipated. So that change may be here to stay. We're gonna talk a little more about that uh, and question whether or not the nine to five uh, work environment that we knew uh, is, uh, is a thing of the past. Uh, and importantly as well in that area, we wanna talk about how companies develop uh, and maintain corporate cultures uh, when there's very limited personal interaction uh, among workers and team members. And third, uh, what about the economic winners and losers resulting from the pandemic? How do industries like retail, or in Tom's case, hospitality, uh, or the uh, travel business uh, industry, how do they recover? And the winners like tech, for example, uh, have a huge upside. Uh, but how do they maximize those opportunities? We also need to address ongoing supply chain issues. Um, everybody's running into that. You know, first it was materials, then it was logistics, and now there are labor shortages. And you've already here, you're being warned about uh, product shortages this holiday season. So make sure you hit the bookstore uh, before you go home <laughs> for the holidays. So these are the issues that uh, the panel addressed. We had a, a very dynamic uh, day uh, talking with 22 students, uh, as, uh, uh, as Dr. James mentioned, uh, from the business policy class. Uh, we broke them up into three uh, uh, different areas and, uh, uh, and, and, and different teams. 
uh, you're going to hear uh, from them uh, today on video, and uh, they're going to take us through what their findings were. I think you're going to find it uh, to be a very high energy uh, uh, performance. So uh, let's get into the program. I'm first going to turn it over to Brian uh, to have him talk about the technology teams and their findings. OK. Am I on? Check. OK, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> hello, Mom. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to speak uh, to, to the crowd about, um, as Dick said, the impact that the pandemic has had on technology, and it's a very significant one. So the story starts in 2019, let's say December of 2019, before we, we had even heard the word coronavirus or COVID. And at that time, where the world stood was we were in the early stages of what economists are referring to as the fourth industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution was in the 18th century and it was driven by the steam engine. 19th century, there was a second one that was driven by electricity. And then the third industrial revolution in the 20th century was driven by computing, the computers. So this fourth industrial revolution, which as I mentioned, had already been in, in, um, kick-started, is being driven by powerful technologies that are literally changing the world and how we live and how we do business. So, so that's happening in the background. So then you, you get to March 17th or so of 2020, and the world shuts down. So at that point, what, what had happened? What really happened is everyone was forced to go home. Um, remote working was, was put into place, not by choice, but just because there was no other way. And people turned to, to these uh, to live and to tra transact and to order goods and services online. So it was really a tipping point for companies as it related to those technologies that I referred to. So the experts say that within two months of the pandemic, three to four years worth of acceleration of those technologies were put into place. Again, it's, um, you know, it was out of necessity that that happened. It wasn't, um, companies were prepared to do that over a period of time but once we were all shut down, it really pushed, pushed the needle forward. So those technologies that, um, that I'm talking about that were driving this industrial revolution include many technologies, two of which we, uh, we chose with the student group, artificial intelligence and robotics. Those were the two that we, we really wanted to focus on. Um, and so what we did was we, we went through a process with the student teams where we had a series of Zoom calls, um, and we introduced some subject matter experts to the, to the students and to the kids so that they could learn a little bit more about the topic. And so, so for my area, I want to thank uh, Dan Grady, who works at ServiceNow, who spoke to the kids about artificial intelligence. And as, as my dad and I were speaking, what we were really, really happy about the way Dan did it was he took a very technical topic that um, as business people, you know, we're not computer programmers, we're, most of us are business minds, and he really broke it down, I, I think, really well to, to a, a place that we could understand it. So I want to thank Dan. Um, so now what we're going to do next is you're going to see two videos that were created by the students after we went through some research. And so I'm going to hand it over to Todd to hit the videos, and then after that, we'll come back for a panel discussion. That looks like he's ready to go. Here's Jack. There he is. This is what you might think of when you hear about the increased integration of robots. Realistically, you should be thinking of something more like this. An automated or operated system of machinery that will increase the effectiveness and efficiency of each and every industry as COVID continues to change businesses' day-to-day -day operations. Hi, my name is Jack Almond, and I'm a senior marketing major here at St. Bonaventure University. Hi, my name is Claire Carpenter, and I am a senior marketing major. Hi, I'm Jennifer Stumpf, and I'm a senior marketing major here at St. Bonaventure University. 
As coronavirus reshapes the economy, it's also having a significant impact on how we work. This crisis seems to be accelerating a number of work trends that existed before the pandemic. We're shopping online more often, working from home more than ever, and also adopting new technology into our everyday lives. As contact becomes more dangerous and people pivot to working from home, robots have emerged as a powerful tool for businesses and organizations wanting to keep everyone safe. Here's how COVID-19 has pushed robots into the spotlight and the impact they will have even after the pandemic ends. Despite death and economic destruction from COVID-19, robots are effective in creating social distance, reducing touch points, disinfecting the workplace, safeguarding hospital staff, and keeping companies up and running when workers are not available. As with changing consumer habits, which many economists believe may become permanent even after the current crisis ends, the present situation could spur significant robot adoption down the line. Even with the growth of automation platforms and the adoption of new computer technology, like artificial intelligence, most experts see collaborative robots or cobots as the future of this field. This consideration is true in all industries, including the tech and robot heavy sectors like manufacturing, where companies leaders have completely dropped the idea of robot ran sites for sites ran by cobots and other collaborative tools. The e-commerce boom has also expanded the use of autonomous mobile robots, robotic forklifts, and related technologies not captured in robotic statistics. The same is true of collaborative robots, a rapidly growing segment of the market that is likely underreported about the size and growth of the robotics market. The COVID-19 pandemic has been the catalyst for immense growth within the tech industry. This can be seen especially within the healthcare sector. For example, implementing robots to remove or minimize time spent on routine administrative tasks which can take up 70% of a healthcare practitioner's time. The future we envision is people and automation working together rather than automation replacing people. Robots will augment people and perform jobs that people do not want to do or are not as good at. And this will allow people to do the jobs they are better at and want to do. In the long run, the adoption of robots into the workplace is likely to continue. The increased efficiency that these robots offer may encourage companies to reduce labor spending and cut jobs that have traditionally been difficult or impossible to automate. All in all, robotics in the workplace is here to stay. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation on COVID-19 and robotics within business. When was the last time you had a face-to-face -face meeting without any masks or technology? Due to COVID, AI is the number one form of communication in the workplace and throughout school and education. Hi, I'm Brandon Wise. I'm Matt Bielabrada. I'm Sean Wesley. And I'm Brooke Japinka. Zoom is one of the most major uses of AI in recent technology, and it was heavily implemented during the pandemic in the workplace and in schools. So what is AI? AI is a constellation of many different technologies working together to enable machines, senses, comprehend, and act with human-like levels of intelligence. AI works by combining large amounts of data with fast and processing intelligent with algorithms, allowing the software to learn automatically from patterns and features in the data. In everyday life, AI is used widely to provide per personalized recommendations to people based on their examples on their previous searches and their purchases and the other online behaviors. AI is highly used and important in commerce, optimizing products, planning inventory, and logistics. Our topic is how AI is changing the nature of work and how the pandemic influenced this change. Once COVID hit, 41% of companies saw an increase in products and services because everybody started working from home, school was online, and everybody started shopping online. Remote working helps companies move 40 times faster than before the pandemic. According to a new McKinsey Global Survey of Executives, the companies studied have accelerated their technology for their consumers and supply chain by three to four years because of COVID. 
With the emergence of artificial intelligence comes the idea that millions of jobs will be lost globally, which is true. The World Economic Forum estimates that 75 million jobs will be displaced by 2022 because of AI. However, the WEF also estimates that 133 million new roles will be created because of this technology, resulting in a total increase of about 58 million new roles in the next few years. What does this mean for young people entering the workplace or current workers? We're going to have to develop new skills in order to adapt to this new job market. For example, some of the top growing job opportunities include software programmers, data analysts, or social media specialists. In the healthcare industry, for example, the emergence of new AI technology has made many healthcare workers fearful for the future of their jobs. However, AI analysts suggest the opposite, that new AI technology will actually increase the amount of jobs available in the healthcare industry. Many healthcare jobs, such as caregiving and rehabilitation, require human emotions. New AI technology could potentially replace certain administrative jobs, such as those dealing with medical record maintenance. Since before and during the COVID pandemic, Amazon has been one of the largest users of AI and helped everyone throughout the pandemic. When people shop on Amazon, they almost always get suggested products related to other recently pur purchased products. This is a component of how AI is seen in almost everyone's daily lives and how an example of how other companies can implement AI in their everyday lives. Thanks for taking the time to listen to our intro on AI. <clears throat> great job, teams, great job. So uh, Brian, let's start with a question to you. Uh, we, we did cover in both the robotics and uh, AI section there, this concern about people gonna be replaced by machines. Uh, and I think we had a, I think we debunked that in our, in our discussions with the team today. You wanna comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, we've debunked it uh, to, to the extent that people just need to accept that the robots will exist alongside them in a collaborative way as opposed to taking over their position, so. Okay, all right. So uh, obviously those technologies are gonna bring about incredible opp opportunities, uh, but what are the challenges and risks that are yeah. posed by, by this advancement? Yeah, good question. So I'm gonna st start my answer to that one with a quote from Stephen Hawking, who was um, you know, one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century, the subject of the film, uh, The Theory of Everything. He was quoted as saying that the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. So. Oh, that's upbeat. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, but that, that is the doomsday scenario of robots taking over the world. And so I, I, I don't see that happening. It's certainly not in the, in the next 100 years. But before we even get to that point, in a more immediate future, um, we do have some risks and some challenges to deal with. The first one on my list here is data privacy. So, you know, our consumer information, the, the, I keep pointing to my phone, but the amount of information about us that's coming through these things to these large tech companies is, is pretty staggering. Right. Um, and so a lot of times these companies are using our personal data even without our consent. Um, and if, if you've been watching the news, you've seen what's going on with Facebook. Um, you know, they're constantly, it seems, in front of Congress with a, a whistleblower coming out with a report uh, showing that they're putting profits over privacy and, and ethical concerns like that. So that's, that's number one on my risk sheet. Um, the second one is data bias. So if, if the concept is, as was explained great by the students, that artificial intelligence takes data, runs it through an algorithm, and then it spits out an, an outcome or a decision. So that whole chain is only as good as the data that's going in. So if the data is biased one way or the other, you're gonna get a decision that may or may not be, be factual. So that's number two. And then on the third risk for me um, is, is cyber security. Mm -hmm. And so with everything being connected to the digital world and, and to the internet, um, not just computers, but phones, wearables, our television sets. Um, there, there's a lot connected there that can be um, shut down. And, and, and I actually, with, without being um, too negative, I do see the next big crisis 
hopefully it never happens, but if it were to happen, I think it would be in the area of, of cyber attacks towards you know, a utility grid or something really, really detrimental. So there's, there's a lot going on here that's great about um, technology, but there's a lot of things that I think we all as a society, putting business aside, need to really focus on and make sure we manage it so we don't go down a slippery slope. Sure. Let's, let's get a different perspective. Donard, you're uh, in a governance role uh, uh, with a large uh, public company. Uh, you're traveling throughout Europe and, uh, and the US. Uh, how about your perspective on, uh, on all this technology acceleration and, and um, interested what you hear about this in your travels? Sure. Well, I think that the first thing to say is that systems held up robustly and companies, while they're very concerned about hacking and cyber breaches, there will be big investments coming to upgrade systems even more. I mean, the speed at which this pandemic developed was am amazing, and yet companies had literally days to put their entire uh, computer-based workforce out uh, into their homes and support them, and that has been extraordinary. Um, I also think that Microsoft Teams and like video collaboration technologies are here to stay. Um, they have led to a dramatic reduction in business travel. There will be challenges as to what's necessary in business travel going forward. Uh, they enable what we call the hybrid model, which is very popular with employees, although they really haven't defined it yet. And they uh, will be more increasingly done through phones uh, and, 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 and the like. Um, for example, uh, we have a big project going on at the moment aided by Accenture that's going to take our entire transaction-oriented HR system and put it into the phone so that employees interact with the company on all matters relating to their employment through the phone, including their evaluations, their assessments, their progress, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and embedding artificial intelligence into manufacturing is something that's, that's really needed because there's an enormous shortage of workers and of skills uh, and it's a real solution for that area. I also think that in using uh, artificial intelligence, data management and warehousing and, and the ability to interrogate to respond to shareholder and regulator demands for accountability and new measurement systems as is evidently coming with respect to sustainability, uh, another branch of where, where we, we are going to be actively using it. And finally, I think um, uh, there are things happening even further out in terms of uh, why, the, why the team didn't address this uh, because we wanted to keep a scope thing, but if you just start to read about the era of supercomputing coming to an end, who would have thought we'd ever hear that, and replaced by quantum computing, uh, there's lots to go on and happen in this arena going forward. Okay. Quick follow-up for, for both of you on, on uh, advice for business majors. Uh, uh, these students, what, what kind of skill sets are they going to need to work on to be able to cope with this technology ad advancing world? Well, I, I, I thought about that. Uh, I, I wrote down a few uh, that could come quick to mind. Computer science, math, critical thinking. Communication, oral and written, uh, marketing, especially social media and understanding of that, and measurement, return on investment, social media measurements, sustainability measurements. Um, I, I must say that I was very encouraged by, what I, by our interaction with all the teams today and by what I saw as an obvious set of skills uh, that, that uh, will meet the needs going forward from uh, this group. Okay. Brian? Anything? Yeah, but I, I agree that similar to my list, I, I had down a term called data literacy. So in the past, the working with data was like an IT thing. That's, that's gone, it's, it's across the organization. So no matter what role you're in, you're gonna have to be comfortable working with data. That's number, number one. So as far as the students and, and what they need to do to be successful, um, data is going to be there, but it's only a value if it's analyzed appropriately. So it's, it's the analytical mindset, I think, that companies are going to be seeking. Right. The, just, you know, the, the, the professionals who can look at the relationships between different data points and draw meaningful conclusions to make business decisions. And I'll add a third one in here, which um, is sort of unique and definitely relevant to, to us as a Bonaventure family, but 
um, Franciscan values. So business ethics and you know, the things I spoke about before about how these companies are operating, which I think if we took a poll, I think most of us probably uncomfortable with, with how these companies are running without any regulations. And so I think that in the future, people who know where the line is of what's right and what's wrong and when is it okay to cross it and not cross it is gonna become very, very important as it always is, of course, but even more so in the, in the digital world. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Let's, uh, let's move on to the changing uh, workplace and get uh, both Jennifer and, and uh, Tom a little more engaged. Uh, uh, Jennifer, you wanna help uh, kick off our, um, our work streams sure. on the changing workplace? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Just, a, just, just a yes. another check. Yes, great, thank you. First of all, I wanna say thank you. Um, we're living and breathing this hybrid world right now, so I really wish I was there in person. Um, it's always a magical time to problem solve with the students and, and spend time um, with uh, Dick and Brian and Donard and, and really spend some time at the school. So it always brings me a lot of joy. So I really wish I was there, but I'm happy again to feel a part of this. And I think that's some of the challenges in this new world right now is how can you work in this new world in hybrid, remote, in person, and really do feel that sense of inclusion and feeling a part of the team. Um, second of all, the videos were fantastic. Um, I'm just, again, every time I spend time with the business students here, always really proud of the outputs the students uh, put together. So incredibly thoughtful, and I know we'll kick that off in a second. And, uh, and again, I really appreciate St. Bonaventure for taking the extra effort to, uh, to include me with the technology today in sort of this new world. So it is about changing workplace, but I also want to use Dick's favorite world, word, um, which is transformation. I would say it's a transformative uh, workplace and I live and breathe it every day. Um, and as of last week, not only am I leading distribution, but I'm also um, leading marketing. So I inherited a, a new, another department, which means needs a transformation and work using technology and, and data. So that's really the future is, is trying to figure all this out remote and hybrid. Um, so in the last sort of year, 18 months or so, um, within the first kind of couple of weeks after COVID really initiated, the number of remote workers doubled in the U.S. within weeks. And that's a tremendous change in the labor workforce. I would also say, and I know one of the teams is working on this, around communication. So the processes and tools were rapidly being embraced, and it was really the only way to work. Uh, so using things like Slack or Teams and, and measuring and making sure people felt included and engaged which also led to new types of teams. Um, so in, we took sort of the technology view of scrum teams and we applied it to our entire company right now, which is sort of net to the next topic is really changing the culture because it's really now how do you take this teaming approach and measure productivity and output. Um, so teams have changed, culture has changed, communication processes are changing, recruitment processes are changing, and how we recruit and never meet a person um, in person, and, and you're bringing them, and how do you onboard them and make them feel a part of the culture, and how do you get them to communicate with people that are remote and in person. So all of that is rapidly changing, and I'm living and breathing it every day. Um, tone at the top differences from company to company. Um, and I really was fascinated with the video um, uh, in Donard's leadership around winners and losers. But just tone at the top is also a, is, is a big change about how CEOs are embracing remote and hybrid or demanding workers to come back to the office, which really puts an intersection and even a bigger change in the labor force. So we're hearing things come up in the labor right now about the Great Depression and the biggest labor change we've ever had before or the great resignation um, that's happening right now because of burnout and dissatisfaction with certain cultures and how we're becoming more candidate centric and which also led to something called the great mismatch, which is the difference between job seekers and employers. And then it leads to the great she session, which is the greatest exodus of women in the workplace, almost 4.2 million women leaving the workplace because they had to manage their home life or young children. Um, so a lot of changes, um, physical health and mental health. And 
one of the things we also tried to work through were how do you keep your employees motivated and motivational reward systems and surveys and early warning systems. So it really is transformative and it's and sort of constantly changing and becoming its own way of working right now. So um, with that, I thought I would turn it over to these incredible videos. And one video is um, around the communication and then how employees are communicating during the pandemic. And then the second video is around how to maintain or change their unique cultures in this sort of very difficult period. Um, so over to St. Bonaventure. Okay, Jen. Thank you. My name is Kean Collins, and I'm a senior marketing major from Corning, New York. My name is Sienna D'Angelo, and I'm a senior marketing major from Pittsburgh, PA. My name is Noel Gangarosa. I'm a senior management major and marketing minor from Rochester, New York. We're very excited to discuss how organizational culture has changed throughout the pandemic. But before we get into that, let's talk about something that's on the back of all of our minds, COVID-19. From quarantine to long family walks to making TikTok videos in our rooms, we all went a little insane during 2020. The pandemic has changed our everyday lives. With us as students, where we had to adjust to hybrid learning, to wearing these guys in class, to everyone else's lives in the workforce, from the healthcare industry to small businesses. So many businesses had to adapt to this new change, including how to communicate, operate tasks, and adjust to the new hybrid work life. We are living in an interesting time, and it's vital for us to understand how different companies are changing their culture to adjust to this change. Through this presentation, we hope we can help you have a better understanding of what exactly organizational culture is and why it's so important, how did companies try to maintain their unique culture, and how did these companies translate their new culture as they went back to a hybrid work environment. So what exactly is organizational culture? The Society for Human Resource Management defines organizational culture as the proper way to behave within an organization. This is created by the common beliefs and values shared by leaders that are then given to employees. Organizational culture is important for any business to succeed. If a business is functioning well externally, that means they're working well together amongst the employees internally. Businesses had to adapt, learn, and teach new values to cultivate a company through these difficult times while keeping people safe. Instead of focusing on the downsides and the challenges of remote work, really analyzing the way that it has benefited employees can strengthen your work environment. Instacart is a company that took pride in how its culture was adjusted throughout the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, they had to make sure that they were able to help out all 2,000 plus employees. There were numerous workshops for employees to talk about important topics during this time. This opened the door to discuss politics, work experience, and so much more. Instacart recognized the effect that the pandemic was having on the team's mental health. Because of this, they introduced benefits to support employees while they were working remotely from home. In order to do this, they made sure that they were flexible, that way they were accommodating for their workers. In order to maintain a positive culture while working remotely, they show trust and confidence in their employees to do their work. Through organizational culture, communication improved drastically. Through this graph, it depicts how employees are twice as more likely to speak positively about their communication within the workforce during the six months of COVID-19. While it's important to understand how companies succeeded during the pandemic, it is crucial for us to look at how they translate their new culture as they go back to a hybrid work environment. After a year stuck working at home, companies are making an effort to get their employees back into the office, whether that be full-time or in a hybrid work environment. Data from a Harvard business survey shows that 81% of people do not want to go back to the office full-time. Companies need to create a plan specific within the departments for a return in the office. They want to focus on whether the work is necessary and if the employees are comfortable returning in the office in person. As we continue to transition to the new normal, it's important to recognize the values that organizational culture has implemented on businesses. Organizational culture will continue to play a key role in the success of companies. We would like to thank the Kearns family, Tim McCarthy and Professor Palmer for helping us dive deeper on how human resource relates to organizational culture. Thank you so much for watching this video and we hope you learned a little more. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many companies had no choice but to transition to a hybrid or fully remote work environment. 
However, communicating virtually between employers and employees can be as frustrating as your favorite Netflix show buffering, and ultimately, the connection and message may be lost. I'm Max. I'm Madison. And I'm Grant. And today we'll be talking about communications that's changing in organizations due to the pandemic. A hybrid workplace is defined as a business model combining remote work with office work. It may look different among organizations, but it typically includes the on-site presence of a core group, while others are free to come and go as they please within reason. It may be the same employees on site, or it could include a staggering of different people present on different days. A hybrid workplace has allowed companies to better protect their employees during the pandemic. One example of a company transitioning well during the pandemic is Microsoft, based out of Redmond, Washington. In 2020, Microsoft implemented a hybrid work model that allowed employees to work from home due to the constraints of the pandemic. Microsoft allows all of its employees to work up to 50% of their time at home, with more being able to be requested from managers at Microsoft. Microsoft is also reimbursing all of their employees for home office supply expenses. Transitioning to this type of work model gave Microsoft employees more flexibility when working, as well as a higher rate of employee satisfaction. One advantage of a hybrid work environment is that employees actually prefer hybrid or completely remote work to traditional office schedules. As you can see in the chart, 20% of people worked from home before the coronavirus pandemic, 71% are currently working from home, and 54% want to work from home after the coronavirus outbreak ends. Due to working at home during the pandemic, there has been a 34% increase in people who want to continue working from home. Most employees have also found that aspects of their job have been very or somewhat easy to achieve while at home. Employees found that having the technology and equipment that they need to do their job has been easy. A whopping 87% of employees feel this way. The aspect that employees had the most trouble with was feeling motivated to do their work. However, 64% still found it very or somewhat easy to do. Communication can eliminate unnecessary problems and promote better performance within the workplace. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there was so much uncertainty that communication became even more vital to a company's success. CEOs were emphasizing quick, clear and precise communication with their employees, which eliminated the chance for confusion or miscommunication. Utilizing technology was a key form of communication during the pandemic. Zoom allowed video conferences to be held between companies all around the world, and Microsoft Teams was also utilized as an important platform that allowed companies to collaborate and communicate efficiently with one another. Now that you've seen the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on workplace communications, what strategies can companies use to effectively engage their employee workforce while working from home? These include fostering social interaction between employees, showing employees you care and having meaningful, meaningful interactions, asking for and listening to employee feedback, and recognizing employee contribution. These different methods of engaging virtual employees make working from home much less clinical and more similar to an in-person work environment. Thank you for taking the time to learn about how communication and organizations is changing due to the pandemic. We hope you enjoy the rest of the lecture. Thank you. Okay, great job workplace teams. So um, a couple of quick questions, and, and Jen, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, recognizing that you've uh, been living in this uh, remote uh, work environment for about a year and a half now. You joined a company that you never really visited, uh, and, and here you are. So uh, obviously, the, um, the consensus is that the nine to five workplace is thing. Right. Talk a little yeah. bit. Talk a little bit about your views on that. Uh, so it's interesting because I think um, most of the labor up until probably 2007 was the expectation was full time in the office, needed to be seen. Um, that's how you were promoted. That's how meetings were held. It was probably around 2008. Some people once a week may have worked from home. That was sort of the starting of it. We certainly didn't have the word hybrid. It was just work from home Fridays, right? Um, then it, the pendulum swung way far to the other side where no one was going into the offices and now everyone's remote. So that's where I think we've landed in the middle now. And I think it's probably where we're going to stay, which is the three different types of personas in the workplace. So you have the full-time uh, remote, the choice of hybrid uh, 
um, or full time in person. I think what's really going to be starting to change right now is a little bit of what I talked about earlier was there's probably going to be more measurements around um, productivity and output and if employees are engaged or motivated. Um, the challenge is now how do you keep um, people engaged through innovation and solutioning, whether you're hybrid or remote or in-person. So I think all of that is happening through um, these specialized teaming um, that is starting to happen across the industry. Uh, another kind of good sign about this is that it's a candidate-centric market right now. And because it's um, candidate-centric, um, employees are going to have a choice now of what they want, which employees m m didn't really have pre-pandemic. So it's here to stay, um, and uh, I think it's a really... Okay, I think we've, we've lost you, Jen, on the, uh, on the feed. Oh. There you are. Okay, thanks. L let me just move to Tom, okay, because, Tom, you uh -oh. obviously... You obviously worked through this uh, uh, issue uh, in uh, at Marriott. Um, you had to uh, pack up from Washington, move back to Buffalo. Tell us about your experience and specifically, you know, on, on the communication part of this. What did Marriott do well? and not so good. Yeah, absolutely, Dick, thank you. And I think to answer this question, first of all, we have to understand what Marriott's culture is. And like Jen was talking about, candidate-centric, Marriott is a very employee-centric place to work. And that's been instilled by Jay Willard Marriott since he founded his nine-stool root beer stand in Washington, D.C. in 1927. And it's the whole idea of if you take care of your associates, they're gonna take care of their customers, and then those customers are gonna come back over and over, and that's been really the, the cornerstone of Marriott for the last almost 100 years. So, you know, come to March 2020 where Marriott has always, always, always walked the talk. There's never been a time where I've ever questioned Marriott's, you know, culture, ethics, anything like that. So here comes 2020. This is the most devastating era. Um, it was worse than 9-11 and the financial recession of 2008 combined, the impact on the industry. And March 15th, I, along with um, about 80% of my colleagues, were told we were going to be on furlough, meaning that we were still employed by Marriott International, but we would not be working for the next, you know, the foreseeable future. At that time, it was 30 to uh, 30 to 90 days. They gave us the time frame. So, at this point, um, you know, Marriott had to jump into immediate action. So, on the macro level, when you talk about you know culture and and what Marriott did well, and I come back to walking walking the talk here. Our CEO, beloved CEO, um, immediately hopped on and I said what touched me the most was he led with compassion and empathy and was so vulnerable with, with all the associates and said, we have no idea what's going on here. This is a world we have clearly never been through, but know that we've got your back. And I think one of, um, one of the key differentiators with Marriott, and I will forever be grateful for this, especially in the midst of a global pandemic, is for all of their furloughed associates, they maintained healthcare benefits. And that was something that at a macro level, thank God, I you know, that can't even get into that. What that meant to myself and my colleagues um, at that point. And then you also have to remember, obviously that's macro, you have to think micro now. And I oftentimes liken um, Marriott to a Fortune 200 St. Bonaventure and the fact that the community of caring and, and watching out for each other and making sure each other is okay it's second to none, and when we start talking on the micro level, it's managers who are picking up the phone and calling you know, their frontline staff, their housekeepers, their bellmen, and just saying, how are you doing? We know this is a horrible situation. Are you okay? It's you know my supervisor calling, checking in, making sure I'm doing all right. And that was happening across the country, and it's something, or across the world, I should say, and that's something that is just intrinsic to Marriott. So that peer-to-peer -peer outreach, that taking care of each other, and um, I know we had this conversation on one of our Zoom calls. A uh, one of the uh, the student leaders asked, you know, if Marriott took a look and and had to go through this again, which I hope to God we don't. Um, you know, would they do anything differently? And while I'm sure we could have the change management team and advisory consultants from, from the big four come in and give us a list of things that, sure, probably could have shifted, 
Looking back at what we knew at the time, um, I think Marriott handled it beautifully. So I'm a grateful Marriott lifer, you can say, Dick. Yeah, well, that's um plug for Marriott, huh? So exactly. right, get your Bonvoy uh, yeah. numbers uh, ready. Uh, thanks, Tom. The, the, I, I would say the, the whole workplace I issues coming out of this, we need to just keep in mind that it's still relatively early days. So uh, how all of these changes uh, to the workplace and how companies now have, a, a number of them established a high bar in how they responded to their employees, now that expectation uh, is up there. And so there's gonna be a lot to watch in this space. Mindful uh, of, of time, we have uh, uh, another area that uh, Donard is going to lead us through, uh, and that's uh, in talking about the pandemic winners and losers, and also uh, the very important uh, supply chain area. So Donard, want to give us a quick yeah, intro? I, I don't want to steal too much from the, uh, so the video, but because uh, I think they're superb. So I'll, I'll just talk quickly on supply chain and disruption. Uh, just to remind us in the audience that uh, what we were talking about here, what we saw in very short order was the auto companies moving from making autos to ventilators, the War Powers Act invoked to uh, clear obstacles for them. Liquor companies, my previous life, converted to making hand sanitizer. Startups in the liquor company became profitable doing that. Restaurants went to click and collect. There's still massive issues around hygiene within the kitchen and, and being able to get, keep employees in there without them getting sick. Grocery stores and big box shops effectively introduced rationing. Paper products is what comes to mind. I won't go any further. <laughs> Airlines moved to air freighting, uh, precious materials, and believe it or not, pharmaceuticals. And, and, and surprisingly to all, the place where everybody thought supply chain began and ended, China as a supply chain uh, questions came up around the, the whole concept there. So there's a lot to uh, digest, and the team will do a really good job on that. In terms of the, um, in terms of the actual uh, disruption and the, the winners and losers, I think the team does a great job on the winners and losers. I would just remind us on the disruption that in November, December of 19, we were hearing reports of another virus out of China. There's been seven before, so whatever. December, January, we're hearing shutdown in Italy and, 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 and enormous deaths. January, February, we shut down our borders. And by March, the world shut down. So that's how fast it happened. And that's how quickly things had to, had to adapt. And believe you me, they've been doing so since, because I could go into what was going to happen last Easter, what was going to happen by June, what was going to happen in September, how the vaccine was coming in November and December, what happened in January to March this year, what happened in the second quarter this year, what's still happening. So we're getting better actually at dealing with the whole uh, disruption that's coming into things. But one of the, some of the things that came out of it was we sure as quick defined essential services, energy, food, including manufacturing and sale, pharma, and anything to do with first responders. And secondly, we saw the government take massive programs to ensure that employees and industries were somewhat cushioned through the uh, initial part of this. I'm sure mistakes were made, but uh, uh, it, it really was very interesting to see how governments across the globe uh, uh, reacted to this in a, in a memorable phrase, we are all in this together. So without saying any more now, I'd love to have those two videos run. Hi, I'm James Johnson. I'm Connor O'Brien. I'm Katie Goodwin. I'm Victoria Vega. And we're going to talk about the pandemic implications on supply chains. Oh. James, do you remember the entire world freaked out over toilet paper? Thank God that's over. Over? You didn't hear about Costco? No. They just re-implemented how much toilet paper you can buy. What? Yeah. Costco has been having the issues with toilet paper due to their supply chain. Supply chain is the sequence of processes involved in the production and distribution of a commodity. For instance, distributing vaccines has been one of the biggest challenges supply chains have ever faced. Coupled with a lack of proper cold chain infrastructure and weak distribution channels, the pandemic has exposed numerous aspects of supply chains. Next, we will get into what companies did well and what companies suffered throughout the pandemic.
During the pandemic, everyone struggled, but Amazon was one of the exceptions. And just because they were online doesn't mean they were locked to do well. They had a surge of unexpected orders that caught them off guard, and they had a hard time meeting the two-day delivery window that's promised to all Amazon Prime members, which you pay $120 annually for. Their ability to be dynamic and adapt to change was why they were so successful. They spent billions on COVID-related products like gear for workers, and they told their third party that products like hand sanitizers and paper towels were a priority for them. Nike was a company that struggled. Many supply chains for Nike are overseas in places like Vietnam. And with Vietnam shut down, there's a huge bottleneck when everyone's placing orders and there's no inventory. Nike's inability to produce an adequate supply has caused share prices to drop in recent weeks, making it crucial to improve supply chains. Companies that did well had to battle through supply chain issues like labor shortages and inflammation. 73% of companies saw a drastic decrease in applications coming in. 9.5 million people were unemployed during the pandemic and now only 9.2 million jobs are being offered. Those jobs are mainly blue collar jobs and manual service jobs. It is clear that the entire world has been struggling when it comes to global supply chains in the past year. As a solution, companies have began to transition into regional supply chains as opposed to outsourcing from across the world. This can make companies better off with automation and give them better access to distribution channels. Thanks for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. The world of business is like a football game. Some industries will be winners and some will be losers. In the year 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic was the factor determining which teams would be successful and which teams would fumble. Hi, my name is Matt and with me today I have Jake, Claire and Lauren and we're going to be talking about the winners and losers during the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic created a huge split in the economy like never before. The GDP decreased 3.5%, which is the lowest growth rate since 1946. Nearly 2.5 million Americans were unemployed and there was a total of 9.4 million lost jobs. We're still seeing these effects today. Due to the pandemic, 15,500 retail stores closed in 2020. Um, there was a massive stoppage of foot traffic in these stores and people got used to shopping online where they didn't because they didn't feel the need to go to the mall or go to these brick and mortar stores anymore and they felt safer being able to shop from home another group that was adversely affected by the pandemic were restaurants um they finished 2020 with a decrease in 240 billion dollars below what they were projected to for the year 111,000 closed during the year and just over 8 million employees were laid off. Um, they tried to counteract this by having discounts or outside dining and to-go options, but it wasn't enough to counteract the pandemic. Hi, my name is Claire. So travel spending had a 42% decline from 2019 and international travel fell 76% as well. The world's largest cruise company in Carnival had a $10.2 billion in net losses as well. Airbnb, though, had a competitive advantage, and this caused them to flourish like many other companies and industries that we will get into in a minute. Hi, my name is Jacob, and I'm going to be talking to you about how essential grocery stores were in decline but were saved by the pandemic. Big grocery stores such as Walmart thrived in e-commerce as their sales jumped 74% and 10% in the first quarter. They also hired 200,000 employees to clean, stock, and fulfill orders. Due to the shutdown, all fitness centers were closed. This created a need for equipment so that people could work out at home. Health and fitness equipment revenue doubled to $2.3 billion between just March and October. Due to the reduced social interaction from the pandemic and many people switching to working from home, social media, commerce, and online gaming, along with workplace communication services such as Zoom, thrived. Zoom specifically went from $623 million in revenue in 2019 to $2.65 billion in revenue in 2020. Okay, Donard, um, 
we talked a lot about the supply chain uh, earlier today, and uh, uh, particularly that it's going to be a long time. Uh, you, you mentioned you were in Los Angeles last week uh, looking at uh, all those ships uh, and trying to get into the port of LA and also down at, uh, in Long, Long Beach. Beach. Uh, and uh, this is not an issue that's going to get solved quickly. No, I, uh, I believe that there's going to be a lot of impacts. Those ships have been sitting out there for three weeks trying to get into port. And when they do get into port, they're dealing with two shift, four day uh, efforts so that you know other other ports are beginning to take up the slack, but there there are big issues out there. If, uh, I, I think there's other things too that are going on. There's a shortage of chips. We went looking for a car this week, my wife and I, and uh, we were lucky to get one. Um, but if I just tell you the anecdotal story that there's a, a raceway out in Kentucky, it's one and a half miles uh, uh, round and has a very big infield. And Ford Motor Company has put F-250s and F-150s that it has no chips for, but manufactured in there to get them out of the factory and to keep things moving. Um, so I think auto industry is in for a very rough time. It, you know, if you have a car to buy, you better plan months, not, not uh, days on it. Um, I think we're going to see energy spikes uh, com coming along, uh, particularly because of switches in certain states to renewable energy, but also because OPEC and Russia have come to dominate things again and they're tightening the, uh, the uh, supply. I think there's real questions, uh, as I said a moment ago, on location of uh, supply chain. And you're starting to see companies manufacture uh, things that they previously manufactured overseas back in this country. And I think there's also moves like Amazon, who are not adhering to what their own standards are, are starting to put major uh, distribution places all over the country to be closer to customers. So I think there's, I, I mean, I could go on and on, but I, I think there's a lot to come. My, my ba basic feeling is that earnings will be impacted next year because it's going to take us about a year to work our way through this. Uh, and then uh, technology will be one of the great assets going forward. Okay. Can industry uh, work itself out of this bottleneck or, or is the government going to have to intervene? Industry believes that it can do it. I think industry uh, is very reticent about government help uh, when, when it can see a way to, to get things done. Um, I, I, I think we will look back at some of the things that government did and believe that it was, it was uh, part of the problem. So for example, the pandemic unemployment payment is a great idea, but keeping it in place at a time when you're trying to bring workers back was probably not well thought through. So I think industry is very careful about those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, Tom, we mentioned in the video talking about uh, uh, business travel, uh, which has a big impact on, on uh, your industry. Uh, what, uh, what do you see in the crystal ball? You know, we're doing so much better. I think what's interesting, um, what's been our saving grace right now has been leisure travel and group travel. I think business travel is going to be the last to come back. But as quickly as that light switch went off for the hotel industry, um, it's as quick as it, it came back on. So starting when the vaccines were rolled out at the beginning of this year, um, we started to see an increase like crazy at our resort hotels. So people that were cooped up for so long, they wanted something to do, they wanted somewhere to go, um, why not take a trip? So Q3, so 2019 was a banner year for the hospitality industry. It's very telling, Q3 um, of 2021, so this year, actually saw a 3% increase over year-end 2019. So it just shows that people are getting back on the road, they are traveling again. Um, you know, the project that I'm part of, I was very lucky to, uh, to secure a role um, with w, or, or w Brand now in Nashville, brand new hotel, and you know, talking to our ownership group, um, Hotels are still a very, very wise investment. I think there's something, they will always be a necessity. Right now, that business travel piece is, is missing, so we're really capitalizing, as I said, on the group business that's starting to come back and that leisure. But we're doing extremely, extremely well. We also can't hire people fast enough. So those, um, you know, obviously there was a lot of movement at the end of last year, beginning of this year, of people who either found other opportunities within the industry or outside the industry. Um, we need them back now. So that's 
that's the big piece right now. So I think our, our hiring patterns are, are extremely telling and okay. looks good right now. The other thing we talked about today, and uh, it has going to have a great impact, particularly on the on the airline uh, industry, is that companies are trying to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, and if you're a service-oriented company and you don't have manufacturing facilities, uh, uh, the only way, uh, or a major way, of cutting back your carbon footprint is to reduce travel. So we're going to have that sort of uh, pressure uh, to bear uh, on as well. So I like your staycation uh, idea Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, please, uh, if anyone's interested in going down for a party uh, in Nashville, <laughs> let us know. We'll all go together, Tom. <laughs> Wonderful thing. Okay. Um, Matricia, Todd, would we have some time for questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you so much. This was very informative, and I know that I learned a lot, and I'm sure that our audience did as well. So if you have any questions, we have time for just a couple. So um, if you'll raise your hand, Annie will bring the light. And because of our COVID safety rules, we can't pass it to you. And ask a question. If you think you speak loud like I do, you can just ask it from your seat. So any questions? Question way in the back. That's Sister Polly. Do you need the mic, Sister Polly? Like questions directly towards Tom. Uh, in regards to getting employees back, was child care an issue? And if so, did Marriott somehow make compensation considering that the schools were closed and they care to? Absolutely, and it's so good to see you, Sister Paula. Thank you for the question. So as far as childcare, um, there are two different buckets that obviously you can look at with Marriott. So you have your corporate workforce and then you have your property workforce. So the corporate workforce right now is still, the majority of those folks are remote. Um, so childcare, if a parent is at home, and again, this is very, very tricky because it's, I, I would imagine, I, I don't have children, but um, I would imagine it's very, very difficult to you know, have a full-time job and also tend to a child while being at home. So um, I, I think that's something that everyone's looking at as they are individual and remote. Um, Marriott does have childcare programs for um, associates. They've also worked with you know, local tutors, they've brought in, at, and this is at the corporate level, they've brought in um, educators, folks like that in the Washington DC area. So to answer your question from a corporate standpoint, absolutely. Um, a little bit trickier on the property side, the only two functions in a hotel that really can play remotely um, and work remotely would be myself in sales and then our team in finance. I was talking to a group earlier, you really can't serve a hamburger and a beer through Zoom, but, um, you know, for those people, it, it has been a challenge. So I think it's a conversation. Uh, Marriott has what's called a take care initiative, and part of that is sort of looking at the overall well being of associates. And that's something that's come up. And I go back to the idea of the community leaning on the community. And, you know, there's actually a forum, one of our employee resource groups is for working mothers um, and, and working parents all around, but it seems to really focus on working mothers. And they have really galvanized and had a number of different idea exchanges, things like that. And again, that's a way that Marriott kind of indirectly approaches that conversation and allows the associates to work through it together. So that's really what's going on more from a, a property perspective. Of course. Can I make a comment on that? Um, <clears throat> I, I have a responsibility under the governance requirements that uh, our company operates as a public company in Ireland as the employee engagement director. That topic that you just raised, sister, is the single biggest issue we have with respect to how we're going to define what a hybrid workforce looks like going forward because of the very things that Tom talked about, which is, you know, which parent will be at home on which day, which days do the children go to, go to uh, their, their uh, daycare, and, and, and you know, what is the company doing with respect to that. When you add to that that we have an Irish workforce and then we have a very big workforce of nearly 3,000 plus in the U.S. and different regulations and different laws, 
it becomes a bit of a nightmare. But it is the one thing that I hear about from an employee engagement standpoint, and it's something that I have brought to our board, and it's something that I've told our HR people we have to take an honest effort at, at solving. So it's a very, very hot topic in this post-pandemic environment. And, and can I add something too um, as well? Um, one, one of the things that we're also learning is um, not only time that's saved with commuting, but they're also seeing that employees who are not only, there's been a big exodus from high expense areas as well, because now employees, about 87% of them, the latest stat I read, want to be remote. So they're also leaving cities and moving to less expensive areas. And if an employee does choose to stay in a more expensive area, the cost saving um, is around two average is around two hundred and fifty dollars a month of saving um, money on commuting. So it's time and money that are also playing into a lot of the changing uh, the work with hybrid too. Thank you. Okay, great. I know that this has been a very interesting topic. We don't have lots of questions, but we are out of time, and I want to take a moment and give Dick Kearns and his flow trials a very big round of applause. School of Business for your continued support to both you and Mo. Mo can stand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Great the College of School of Business and also to the Globetrotters. Thank you for your continued support and thank you for your new and your new support. Welcome back home. You've been gone a little while. Yeah. <laughs> Here, 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 here. Here, here. Thank you very much, uh, Matricia. Uh, a special thank to Dr. James and President Zimmer, who's uh, here in the audience for uh, your support for this program over the years. So we look forward uh, to coming back again next year uh, and seeing an audience with, uh, with no masks. Uh, and, uh, and maybe uh, another banner hanging in, uh, in the Riley Center. Uh, so um, in the meantime, um, thanks again. Uh, stay safe uh, and go Bonnies.